So I messed this up, is that, uh, let me give you a little bit of behind the scenes, is I'm recording this on an iPad, and uh, after I've recorded a video, it needs to upload to the cloud, which takes a good long time. So I wind up working in the lab and doing stuff. And it's uh, the beginning of August, it's pretty, uh, this lab is never well air conditioned when the rest of the building is. So it's toasty and I got fans running and uh, the lights all up. And, uh, but I'm waiting and, and once the video is up on the cloud, I gotta be able to reload it down to my computer so that I can put it places. Uh, I will eventually uh, put it up in Blackboard where you may be seeing this from. I may put it, uh, I'll, I'll put it up on my YouTube channel where you may be getting it from. But, uh, but I screwed up as I went too fast once everything was done, it's like, oh, I can do the rest of the chapter. And, uh, and so I didn't secure the phone on the wall so that it wouldn't ring. I didn't turn off the ringer on my phone so that it wouldn't make noise. Uh, and uh, I don't think I even turned the fan off or, or dimmed the lights. So uh, I, I just roundly screwed up a bunch of ways, but it's all set now. And uh, we can continue with the chapter on uh, on confounding factors. Now here's a term that's not strictly confounding factor. Again, it's related to confounding factors. It's actually, this is related to artifacts. Uh, I know there's an English word for artifacts. It means like old things that you find buried or whatever. But in, uh, in science, an artifact is you get something that isn't a result, but it looks like a result. And when you try to figure out where it came from, it turns out you made it happen the way you designed the experiment. It didn't come from the variable. It came from the way you set stuff up. Like a placebo, we're gonna inject people. Um, here's an artifact. When you test uh, acupuncture, which is what I started to say before the phone rang, is that the act of putting needles into people will make them feel better for a remarkable number of things that we kind of mentally have some control over, like pain and, and other kinds of things, or, or just make them generally feel better even if they've got something pretty nasty. Uh, now that is true whether you actually put needles in them or you make them think you put needles in them. Somebody actually came up with a design like the, uh, the, the daggers you use on stage where the, the blade looks like it goes in, but it doesn't actually go in. And uh, so they, you know, the tip of the needle touches you and then you see it go in. So people think that they're getting, you know, the needles, whatever effects you get in the test group with real needles, you get in the control group. But it's a very, very powerful placebo effect because it's a very dramatic treatment and dramatic treatments will produce stronger artifacts is that people will feel better, but you're not gonna make their diabetes go away. You're not gonna cure their cancer. You're not gonna actually affect their conditions unless their condition is a headache or something that we do have some mental control over. But um, give you another example of an artifact. Uh, some of you have probably maybe heard that uh, you gotta be careful. You don't want to have aluminum pans in your kitchen because uh, when you cook with aluminum, uh, the aluminum gets into the food and it can give you Alzheimer's disease. That is not true, but it goes back to a study that was done when people were trying to figure out what sort of, of environmental factors might uh, affect our brains and produce Alzheimer's. And uh, somebody said, well, I'll look at the brains of Alzheimer's people to see if they've retained any kind of environmental materials in comparison with people who didn't have Alzheimer's. So you take brains from dead people who had Alzheimer's and brains of people the same age, try to, you know, you're always trying to make the comparison equal. People who died at the same age with more or less the same other kinds of conditions. And then you compare, in this case, he was looking for aluminum and he found it. He found aluminum in the Alzheimer's brains that he did not find in the control brains. So he published a paper and people started throwing the pots out and, you know, looking at all the things that might have aluminum in it. Now what also happens in science is that once you've got results out there, people will uh, sometimes redo your experiments because they don't trust them. 
but a lot of times they will use your results to kind of build on something they want to do. And it was another guy who wanted to like puzzle out what, what the aluminum was doing. And he couldn't find the aluminum in the brains of Alzheimer's patients. And so he, peer review, sometimes peer review is like just correspondence after the fact. He corresponded with the guy who did the original studies and finally it came down to, so whenever you're gonna test tissue, you have to preserve it or it will rot on you. What'd you use to preserve the tissue? I use this. Oh, I didn't use that. You know, the preservative you used has aluminum in it. The preservative I use doesn't have aluminum in it. We should check to see whether you actually put the aluminum in there when you preserve the tissue. And it turns out the chemistry of an Alzheimer's brain, there's protein tangles and stuff, and for reasons I don't know, I'm not a chemist, that those protein tangles will actually absorb aluminum from the preservative which normally would wash away when you wash the preservative away once you've treated the tissues. So the normal brains didn't have it. The Alzheimer's brains only had it because he had literally put it there. It was an artifact. It was a product of the procedure and not an actual result from the variable. So there's all sorts of things that can be artifacts. And people go, ah, I think you got an artifact there. Connected to this, good science should be reproducible. If somebody runs your test, they should get roughly the same results you did. Maybe not exactly, but roughly. In this situation, I, I set up the Alzheimer's brains. I thought I had done them the same way you did. I didn't have aluminum. And it turns out that the difference between how he had tried to reproduce the setup was significant enough to point to uh, what the artifact was, was the artifact was from the preservative. And there's been a bit of a um, controversy. Uh, there's the word I'm looking for that I can't get out of my brain, but the controversy is close enough. Um, where certain areas of research, uh, certain areas of medical research, especially psych psychiatric research, uh, even cancer research, is folks have actually gone through and, and redone tests uh, just to test the reproducibility of them and found that there's a tremendous amount of stuff out there that uh, somebody, for one reason or another, when other people try to duplicate the results, uh, duplicate the test and get similar results, they can't do it is that the tests are not reproducible. And uh, that is a big weakness of science if people are rushing things through or they're doing some sort of slapdash kind of uh, presentation of, of what they did and other people can't get it to work the same way. As it, as in medicine especially, that's a really, really big deal. Is that the guy went looking for the aluminum to figure out why it was bad and it really wasn't there anyway. One issue that's kind of an artifact that uh, winds up being a big deal with a lot of these hydroxychloroquine studies and stuff is chance as a confounding factor. Is that if, if I'm gonna test, um, you know, the effects of this nutrient on, uh, on growth, and I test five people, one of whom was destined to be an NBA all-star. And I go, well, okay, what's the final average height for this group? Well, that one person out of five is gonna really skew your average up quite a ways. If you get somebody who was naturally going to be short, no matter what you did, they would skew your average that way. If you add 200 people in your group, the tall person would have a small effect on the overall average. They wouldn't skew it hugely if, as they would in a small group. And so when you run a hydroxychloroquine study and you only got seven patients, which is what happened for some of these, and you know 
one of them does quite a bit better than the other ones for whatever reason. They have nothing to do with the hydroxychloroquine. But in that smaller group, they're really going to skew what looks like the results of your study. Whereas if that one person in a group of a thousand is going to have a very tiny effect on the average result in your study. So you need large numbers large numbers of subjects, large repetitions of the same test. Um, if you don't have that, uh, here's a, a criticism that people will throw at your test. And uh, you've heard this thrown around sometimes with these uh, coronavirus treatments. They'll go, oh, that study's only anecdotal. Now, again, this is an English word where we tell a story about our lives, you know. but. This is specifically in science, it means it's too limited. You didn't have enough subjects. You didn't have enough repetitions to have trustworthy results. Your results are anecdotal. You only tested, this is like the Mythbusters test. You test one thing over here against one thing over there, and then you go, well, this is what we found. That's anecdotal. If, if uh, for whatever reason, this or that is somewhat unusual, you can't trust those results. Mythbusters didn't have the budget to do hundreds of, of tests. Uh, so it was by nature anecdotal. But it's a weakness of that kind of study. Uh, I guess it's an artifact of setup to some extent. This brings us back through the numbers to data. How you feeling? Uh, okay, a little bit better. That's a qualitative measure. How do you use that to compare this subject in your study to other subjects in your study? Is that qualitative data is very fuzzy data and it's very difficult to integrate it into groups and use it for comparisons. Quantitative is numbers. Can I take how you feel and get a number out of it? You know, on a scale of one to, you know, zero to 10, how bad's your headache? Seven. Okay, we give you the treatment, we wait a while. On a scale of zero to 10, how bad's your headache now? Oh, it came down to a two. Well, it's dropped seven to two, five spots on the 10 point scale. And I can use that and average a whole bunch of my uh, subjects and go, you know, my test group, we got the actual treatment, dropped an average of four slots and my control group, they got a pill but didn't actually get treated, dropped an average of one and a half slots. The test group shows better results with this particular treatment. That's quantitative. The world is full of qualitative stuff. You don't even think about is that time is qualitative, but we've, we measure it with numbers because how else do people understand it? Temperature is qualitative, but we measure it with numbers because how else do people understand it? So quantitative not only gives you ways to compare groups, but it gives you information that you can use that will make sense to other people. Drop this many spots on a zero to 10 scale. People understand that. So it's, uh, it's both good for science and good for, um, for getting people to understand science, whereas qualitative is just, it's too fuzzy. You don't want to use fuzzy, fuzzy numbers. But you get a bunch of numbers, what do you do with them? There's a tremendous number of ways to mathematically manipulate your data. And sometimes you absolutely have to do that. Get an average for the group as a mathematical uh, manipulation. There are ways to measure whether your results are reliable results or whether you'd have gotten them just because of you know, random occurrences, just because of chance. Uh, and that varies depending on the size of the group and other things involved. In, but there's an old expression. There's lies, there's damn lies, and then there's statistics. Is that if you know what you're doing, you can get the, the numbers to say what you want them to say. Is right now, how do you measure the results of the coronavirus outbreak? Is that, do you measure it by total deaths? Do you measure it by uh, deaths per population 
like per million. Uh, one of the things they, they're using is deaths above expected over the, the, uh, the month of June for Texas. What's your normal death rate for Texas for June? What did we get this year? How many more deaths did we get than you would expect in a typical June in Texas? Is it, now this one month may be a little anecdotal, we're comparing it to an average and we only got the one year, but it gives you, it's another statistic to, to compare stuff by. And how you use your statistics uh, varies a lot. And, uh, and the type of data that you have and just exactly what it is you're trying to show. But there's a lot of number cooking that happens in the real world. People have gotta be on the lookout for that. That's part of peer review. You've gotta understand the math in order to tell whether somebody is fudging the numbers or not. What are you building towards? You're building toward results and conclusions. Does this evidence support our hypothesis? You don't want to say it proved it, but you say the evidence supports it, or the evidence doesn't support it, although it's really hard to get that stuff published, is that people don't like to publish in journals uh, null hypothesis, null results. Gee, we tried this and it didn't work. It's, that's why peer review in business can be better, because you've got people in the building that goes, yeah, we tried that and it doesn't work. Nobody outside the building knows you ever tried it, but the people in the building do. And when you're in academic research, you may be trying something that five other people somewhere out in the world have tried and found out it doesn't work, but you have no way of knowing that unless you know them personally because it hasn't been published anywhere. So there's, as I'm saying, you know, science is a system, you try to do it a particular way, it's hard in the real world to get it to work exactly perfectly. It's kind of like politics, you know, or democracy or anything. That is chapter two, so we're getting there.